My name is Brett Barra and I'm the founder of Brooklyn Craft Company. I totally caught the bug at a really young age and I couldn't wait to start making things myself. We're making these patchwork pillows which I love because they're a really simple introduction to patchwork. These are a great way to kind of learn how to cut out some nice accurate triangles, learn the basics of piecing patchwork, and then learn how to kind of start playing with color and composition. We're gonna learn how to put in a zipper on a pillow. I know zippers are one of those things that seem really complicated and professional and people are always intimidated by them. It's a really kind of easy way to just start playing with your creativity and thinking outside the box and you'll probably be amazed at what you come up with. I'm Brett Vera from Brooklyn Craft Company, and today we're making a patchwork pillow. This is it right here. It's a graphic triangle pillow. It's got a zipper, so you're gonna learn how to do zippers, even though I know you think you can't, you can. The back is a solid piece of fabric, so it's a fun way to work some pattern into your projects. This is a great one for your sofa, your bed. Let's talk about what you need to make this pillow. Gonna need some fabrics. I like quilting fabrics for this project. You don't need very much for the patchwork part, maybe a quarter yard each of about five different colors. And then for the backing of the pillow, you're gonna need about a yard. And then you're gonna need about a yard and a half of some muslin. And then beyond that, just some basic quilting and sewing tools. We'll need a clear quilter's ruler, um, a cutting mat, and a rotary cutter. If you don't have these tools, that's okay. You can use a ruler or a yardstick and scissors and just mark your lines before you cut them. You're also gonna need a zipper. It should be about two inches shorter than the width of your pillow form. We'll need a zipper foot, and your sewing machine should have come with a zipper foot. Just about every machine comes with a zipper foot standard. You'll need a seam ripper, uh, some good fabric scissors, some pins, and finally a pillow form. And this is just a standard pillow form. I'm using a 20 inch. You could use any size pillow form you like. The math is a little easier for a 20 inch, but we'll kind of talk about how to work that out. So that's everything you need to get started. Next up, we're gonna talk about planning out the triangle design and cutting your fabric. All right, so the first step of this pillow is just sort of planning out your design and then cutting your fabric. As you can see, the design looks like a bunch of triangles, but it's actually squares because it's two triangles seamed together to make a square. So first you have to kind of think a little bit about the math of this project because you want your squares and triangles to fit evenly on the pillow without having like half a triangle on the edge. So I like to use a 20 inch pillow form because it makes the math really easy. So I take a 20 inch pillow form and I know that four five inch squares will fit across a 20 inch pillow form. And uh, just a note, I'm aiming for a finished piece of 20 inches. I'm not leaving any extra room around the pillow. I make my pillow covers the same size as my pillows. And then that way they're kind of plump instead of like baggy. So uh, the first thing we're gonna do is cut a bunch of six inch squares because six inch squares after seam allowance will create five inch squares when they're all sewn together. So we're gonna talk about how to cut a bunch of squares and triangles quickly. And this is kind of a basic thing in quilting. Whenever you have a quilt pattern that has a lot of repetitive shapes, like a lot of triangles or a lot of squares, there's lots of time saving tips that you can do to make your cutting a lot faster. So instead of cutting a bunch of random squares, we're gonna cut a strip and then cut that strip into squares and then cut those into triangles. So here's why I love my cutting mat and why all quilters love their cutting mat and rotary cutter because it makes it so easy to measure what you're doing. So I can just place my fabric along the edge of my cutting mat and then use my clear ruler at the six inch mark and just zip right along. And if you've never used a rotary cutter, it's just like a pizza cutter, but it's really sharp. You don't have to apply a lot of pressure and it's really easy to cut super accurate lines. And now I'm just gonna flip this and I'm gonna cut this into six, six inch squares. This is a great um, learning project. I wouldn't say this is a complete beginner, but this is definitely a, you don't need to have a lot of sewing skills to be able to tackle this project. And what's great is that you're gonna learn how to do basic patchwork. You're gonna learn how to put in a zipper. So 
Lots to learn on this one. Okay, so now I've got three squares. And by the way, my fabric is folded over, so I'm doubled. I've actually just cut six squares. Now I'm gonna cut each of these into a triangle and I'm just gonna go diagonal from point to point. Again, with my straight edge, it's super quick. Just zip right along. All right, so I've already got a bunch of triangles that I cut out here. And I'm using five different colors. I've got three grays, a black, and just a little bit of yellow. So the first step of planning the color design of this kind of project is random. I think that's kind of part of the magic of it. First it's random and then it's a little bit planned. So it's kind of a neat way to see a pattern emerge and you get to kind of like let go a little bit, but also have a little bit of control. I like that. So first we're gonna take um, two triangles and seam them together to make our squares. But at this step, you can just randomly choose your color. So I'm not even gonna think about it. I'm just gonna take two of these and we're gonna place them together, just one on top of the other with right sides together. That's like the golden rule when sewing. You always wanna put your fabrics with their right sides together. There are some advanced exceptions to that, but don't worry about that. Now these fabrics really look the same on the front and back because they're solid, so you're kind of off the hook, but if we were using prints or patterns, you would make sure you had your right sides together. And now I'm gonna go over the sewing machine and sew the first set. Now I'm gonna do another little quilter's trick that's called speed piecing. And what that means, first of all, I should just quickly say I'm sewing with a quarter inch seam allowance. Quarter inch seam allowance is pretty standard for quilting, and that's just something that you're gonna factor into your math when you're planning your pieces and planning how big you need to cut them. And if you're not sure what a quarter inch seam allowance means, there's markings on the plate of your um, sewing machine that have different measurements, like 3 8 inch, 5 8 inch, half inch, and you're just gonna line the raw edge of your fabric up with a quarter inch mark. My machine actually doesn't have a quarter inch mark, but I know where it is. It's right there because I've measured it before in the past. So you're just going to align the raw edge of your fabric with the seam allowance mark. If I were sewing with a 5-8 seam allowance, I would have my raw edge of the fabric all the way over here. And you're just gonna start sewing. Now, this is the speed joining, speed um, seaming technique that I mentioned. So, I'm going all the way to the end of my triangle. Now I'm just gonna stop. I'm not gonna take this off the machine like I normally would. I'm just gonna grab two more pieces, randomly choosing the colors, not really thinking about it. Place them together, right sides together. You could pin these if you want, but honestly with little, little patchworky pieces like this, I don't usually bother pinning them because they're so small that it's pretty easy to just kind of hold on to them while you're sewing. But if you feel more comfortable, by all means, go ahead and pin them in a couple of spots. I'll show you how to pin one just in case you're curious. So I'm taking my two pieces here. Now here's a fabric that does have a right side and a wrong side. So it's easy to see that I'm putting the right side down, lining them up. And then I'm just gonna place my pins perpendicular to the edge I'm gonna be sewing. And I always put my pins with the, the heads facing out to the right so that I can easily remove them with my right hand while I'm sewing. You never wanna put your pins in this way because as you're sewing, you can stab yourself in the hand, which is never good. So, just come back over to the machine. Now you just wanna make sure that you remove the pins before you sew over them. It used to be that they would teach you to just go ahead and sew right over your pins, but that's actually a little dangerous. The pins can break and they can fly off and land in your eyeball or anywhere else. That's no good. Um, and even if something like that doesn't happen, it just can bend your pins and you sew over them. And you know, who wants a bunch of bent pins? That's that's no good. So. I think it's better to just take your pins out. Okay, so now you can see the result of the 
speed seeming is that we have like what looks like a fun little party bunting, but actually we're just going to snip these apart. They're just attached by, by a little thread. And that's just a little time saver, makes it, makes it just a little quicker to feed through and when you're making a project with tons of patchwork pieces, this actually can save you a lot of time. All right, so I've got my triangles all seamed together and the next step is I'm going to press these and then join all the squares together to make our patchwork pillow front. Okay, so now we're gonna press these pieces that we just sewed. So we're gonna take those two triangles and open them up into a square. So there's just a couple of little rules to bear in mind with this. One is that we're gonna always press the seam allowance to the side. Some sewing uh, projects will sometimes have you press the seam allowance open like a book, but in quilting you generally press the seam allowance to the side, and you always wanna press it towards the darker color. The reason for that is when you turn the project over to the right side, you could see that dark seam allowance showing through on lighter fabric, so to prevent that, you always press your seam allowance toward the dark color. So I'm just gonna pull gently on the dark color as I press it from the wrong side, and then I just flip it over and press it again from the right side and hit it with some steam. You want to make sure you have a good steam iron whenever you're sewing. I always say that your iron is one of your most important tools in sewing, if not even the most important thing, because it doesn't matter how nicely you sew every step of the way, if you don't iron your seams well, it's going to look really sloppy. So you want your iron on high heat, Make sure the reservoir has water in it so that you can get lots of steam. All right, so now we've got four squares and we're gonna move on to the next step of composing the patchwork for the pillow front. And I've actually got some pieces here that I've already started assembling, but I'm gonna sort of explain what I did with my little guys that I have in progress here. You might think that you can just kind of place your squares down anywhere and that's gonna give you a good random look. But I actually find that I get sort of a better effect if I put them down randomly, but then kind of start rotating them and putting some colors next to each other. Your first instinct might be, you know, to make sure all the colors are evenly distributed, but it kind of looks really great if you actually clump some colors together. So like here I have um, a few triangles that are all the same color that are together. Here I have another couple of sections like that, also with the yellow. And that actually creates a ton of kind of movement and depth in the piece. So it's just kind of a fun thing to play around with and just a little thing to think about. I think I'm gonna put my, there. That's kind of cool. So now all of a sudden I have a couple of big black triangles. I have a dark gray triangle and then I have some of these diagonal sections, and I've also got a yellow triangle. So I'm feeling it, I think. I think I'm gonna stick with this one. So now I'm gonna talk about seaming these sections together. And one thing to note is you'll see that I kind of have worked in quarters so far, or quadrants, and I do that intentionally. And I think that um, at first glance, you might think that you would seam these together in strips because that just seems you know, sort of easy and quick to make a bunch of strips. I personally don't love to assemble patchworks in strips because I find that when the um, pieces need to meet up along the strip, if there are any areas that aren't meeting up, it becomes really obvious and the inconsistencies actually can grow along the length of the strip. So if you have, if you're just a little bit off at this intersection, you're gonna be a little bit more off here and then a lot off here. And that's just, it's kind of one of my pet peeves. So I find that if I work in square or rectangle sections, that doesn't happen quite so much. And even though you'll still get those points, unless you're a perfect uh, sewer, which I'm not, I get lots of places where my um, intersections don't match up perfectly on a patchwork. But if they're kind of randomly dispersed throughout the piece, you don't notice it as much. Your eye doesn't go to it the same way it does when it's in a strip. So that's why I prefer to work in sections rather than strips, but I think that's kind of one of those things that everybody has their own way of doing it. But let's just talk about now assembling this last section. Really simple, I'm just gonna take any two squares that are next to each other and just flip them so that they're right sides together, line them up, and sew them with a quarter inch seam allowance along the side where they were neighboring.
Now I actually don't do the speed joining technique at this stage of the process because I don't want to lose my place. I don't want to forget which squares were where. So I kind of do it in little bits so that I don't get disoriented because it's kind of easy to forget what was supposed to go where. Not that it's the worst thing in the world if that happens because you can just kind of change up your design, but I like to stick to my plan at this stage of the game. So now I've got my two pieces. I'm religiously trimming my threads as I go. Please don't leave all your threads till the end because it just makes a big mess and they can start to kind of get caught up in your other seams as you go and it's not a good look. So now I just need to quickly press these two seams. Very important to always press before you go on and join again because the next thing I'm gonna do is join these guys and it might be a little tempting to just hurry up and sew them but don't do it, trust me. It's just not good. You really always have to press your seams before you move on to the next join. Quickly press these guys. Here we've got our two pieces now seamed together. Just gonna quickly make sure I didn't slip anything. I think, yes, that one actually went like that. So now we're just gonna join these guys together. Same thing, we're just gonna flip them so that the right sides together. But now that we've got kind of more things going on, I like to just kind of peel it back and make sure my seams are intersecting. So I can see that this seam is meeting up with this seam pretty nicely. So I'm feeling good about that. You could pin at this point. I usually don't bother with the patchwork, but you definitely could just throw a couple pins in there if that's gonna make you feel more secure, no problem. come across seams now that we are sort of seeing together a bigger patchwork when you come across a pre-existing seam you just want to make sure that it remains laying in the position that it was in that you don't kind of accidentally flip it over as you're sewing it because that can just create a bump on the on the back of the project all right time to press this one when at a helm I actually set up my sewing area so that my um, ironing board is lowered to the same height as my sewing table and I like to work in a swivel desk chair so I can just sew and then swivel and iron, go back to the machine and sew, swivel and iron because there's so much back and forth between the iron and the machine when you're doing a patchwork project like this. All right, it's coming along. So now we're just gonna join this guy to its neighbor, same as we have been doing, just flip it, keep them right sides together. Again, I just wanna check and see if my Seams are reading up. Now that's pretty off, so I'm gonna try to adjust that a bit just by sliding it down. That's just happening because I'm not being crazy accurate while I'm sewing. Some of the like really serious quilters just have the utmost precision, more power to them. That's just kind of not my style. To me, I just, I can live with it if it's a little bit off. There, that looks better. So now I'm just gonna zip down this side. Now for thread color choice on a project like this, obviously with a lot of different colors going on, you can't exactly match the thread to each and every fabric. So I usually just try to find something that feels like a neutral that works with everything. For this project, it was pretty easy to choose a gray since I've got so many grays. But actually light gray is a really good neutral. It kind of blends with a lot of things. So I often go with a light gray. Okay, now I'm gonna press this guy. Again, pressing from the back and then flipping it and pressing on the front, giving it some steam. All right, we're so close. We're almost there. These are the last two, and this is the biggest seam because we've got several intersection points, so I'm just gonna be a little more careful to try to get them to match up. I can already see they're not all going to totally match up. It's okay. Some quilters that are really serious are really into precision and making sure every single intersection is perfect. That's really admirable, but that's just kind of not really my style, and. You know, maybe it's your style, maybe it's not, but I'm not gonna sweat it. I'm just gonna choose to kind of match up my center point 
and then let the others do what they will. So I'm gonna flip this, and then I'm gonna check on that center seam by just peeling it back and seeing how it looks. Just shift it a tiny bit. Okay, I am gonna pin this side because it's so long. Uh, I don't want it to shift too much on me. So I'm just gonna place a few pins. Again, you can see that I've got a lot of unevenness here with my edge. It's okay, I'm not gonna sweat it. It's all gonna be hidden inside the, uh, the next seam. Some sewing projects really require accuracy, like if you're sewing a garment, you really need everything to be just right or you're gonna have like a really funky sleeve or a really funky neckline, but other things, you can be a little more free-spirited. Okay, so quarter inch seam allowance on this as well. Now in an area like this where there's a lot of unevenness, I usually do my seam allowance based on the edge that looks most even. I can kind of see that this upper edge is kind of more in line with the actual side I'm gonna be sewing. So I'm just gonna kind of ignore this one that's um, extending underneath. You could go in and trim that out, but I'm just gonna pretend like it's not there. A lot of people ask me why I don't backstitch a lot when I'm sewing. Um, I personally don't bother backstitching on seams where I know it's not a final seam. So in other words, in something like this patchwork, each seam is gonna get sewn into another seam relatively quickly in the process. So I'm not that worried about backstitching. I'm not worried about any of my seams coming undone. There's not gonna be a lot of pressure on them and I know that they're going to get finished off within another seam. So I just don't bother. If you feel totally crazy without backstitching, you can totally do it, it won't hurt anything, but in my opinion, I just don't think it's always necessary. There are times when it is necessary, like when we do our zipper, and I'll talk about that. Okay gonna press this and our pillow top will be complete. I'm just gonna give the whole piece a good ironing here just to make sure it's as smooth as it can be. Some people will even use a spray starch right now at this stage just to really kind of set the patchwork and keep it all flat. I don't think it's really necessary in this case, but it's something you could do. There it is. You might notice I've been calling this a patchwork, not necessarily a quilt. I know I've been probably using some quilting terms, but the reason I'm calling this a patchwork is because it's not actually going to be quilted. When you quilt something is when you layer it with batting and a backing fabric, and then you sew them all together in the machine, and this isn't actually gonna get any quilting. It's just gonna stay a patchwork. Now we're gonna treat this patchwork like it's one big piece of fabric and make a larger pillow out of it. So we're now done with the pillow front. Um, I might just go in and trim up some of these really ragged edges, but otherwise we're ready to assemble the pillow. Now it's time to finish assembling the pillow. We're gonna put the front and the back together with the zipper. Um, so now we're gonna treat our patchwork like it's just a solid piece of fabric as we proceed. So we are assembling the front and back and we're also making kind of a faux lining on this pillow. And the reason for that is the back side of the patchwork has so many seams. And when you insert your pillow form in there, you don't want these seams getting all kind of disturbed and ruffled because that might make it look a little lumpy or bumpy on the front. So we're just gonna kind of line this with an extra layer of muslin fabric behind it. And muslin, if you're not familiar with it, it's just a really simple white or off-white fabric, really plain. It's usually used more for kind of, um, oh, sort of um, functional reasons rather than beautiful reasons. And we're also gonna put a layer of 
muslin behind our backing piece. This is the back of the pillow. And the reason for that is this is a quilting cotton on the backing. And quilting cottons are so beautiful. There's so many patterns. Everyone loves to use them, myself included. But I find that they can sometimes seem a little light in some um, applications, like for home decor applications. They can almost come off as a little flimsy when you're using just a single layer. So I like to put another layer of muslin behind this in the pillow, and that just helps to kind of like give it a little more body and just make it feel a little more professional. All right, so now we're gonna talk about how to layer all these pieces so that when we assemble them, the lining pieces will be on the inside and the outer pieces will be on the outside. And it's not too hard to do. I'm just gonna take one piece of muslin and my pillow back and I'm gonna layer them together. I'm gonna to layer the muslin on the wrong side of the pillow back and I'm gonna have the pillow back right side up. Now I'm going to take my patchwork and I'm going to put it right side down on my pillow back and just always remember the rule of thumb of right sides of the fabric are always together so right sides of our pillow front and back are together. So there they are. And if you had a top to your triangle, if you were kind of planning your colors in any way that there was a top, just remember that the edge that you put the zipper on will be the bottom of your pillow. So if you want to orient your patchwork in any special way, just think about that now. And then one more piece of muslin behind the patchwork. So the layer is, I mean, the order is muslin, backing, patchwork, muslin we've got a little pillow sandwich going. Okay, it's zipper time. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't want to put a zipper in my pillow. I'm just going to skip that part. I'm going to sew up my pillow by hand. But honestly, zippers are so easy and they look so professional and you're going to feel so amazing after you do it that I really encourage you to just, just do it. I promise it's not hard. All right, so here's our zipper. This is just a regular all-purpose zipper from the fabric store. The thing with these is sometimes, um, sometimes it's hard to find a zipper in exactly the right size. This one is actually too long. For this pillow, I like to use a zipper that's two inches shorter than my pillow. So my pillow is 20 inches, so my ideal would be an 18-inch zipper, but this was a 22-inch zipper. There's an easy solution. It's very easy to shorten a zipper yourself. So I'm just gonna take my zipper, I'm going to measure 18 inches and zipper lengths are always go according to the end to end of the zipper stoppers. You don't count the tape in your measurement of the zipper. So I'm going to place the end of the zipper there and I'm going to measure down to 18 inches, which is here. And I'm just going to mark that. Technically I should use like a disappearing ink pen because whenever you're sewing, um, it's not really good practice to use like a Sharpie on your fabric just because you never know when it might bleed through or show, but just for demonstration purposes, I'm using this Sharpie. Now I'm gonna go to the machine and I'm gonna do a zigzag stitch back and forth over these zipper teeth. And that's just gonna kind of like make a new stopper. And it's really just gonna take the place of a metal stopper that was manufactured on the zipper. And everyone always says, switching to a zigzag stitch, by the way, everyone's always like, what? You can sew across your zipper teeth? Yes, you can. You absolutely can. It won't hurt anything. Just go right across. I'm going to press reverse and go back. Forward again. Back again. I usually do about four passes, but I think even one pass would be plenty because really anything that would kind of like Think about how easy it is to jam your zipper. If you get a little thread caught in your zipper, the zipper won't work. And that's really what we're doing here. We're just kind of jamming the end of the zipper. You can cut that off about an inch past the part you sewed. And now you have a new short zipper. This is one of my favorite tricks in the world. All right, so now we're going to actually install the zipper on the fabric. So again, I'm going to just use my cutting mat and I'm gonna measure, I'm gonna center my zipper on the mat. So now my zipper ends are centered about an inch and a half in from the edges. I'm gonna mark this again with my Sharpie, 
just so I know where my zipper ends were and I can set aside my zipper for now. Now I'm gonna pin all of these layers together. Okay, so I've pinned all along the bottom and now I'm gonna go over to the sewing machine. But let me just explain first the concept of what I'm gonna do. Here's my side I'm gonna sew. Here are my two marks I made for where my zipper begins and ends. I'm gonna sew with a regular stitch up until that mark. Then I'm gonna back stitch to lock in my stitching in place. Then I'm gonna to switch to a basting length stitch and I'm gonna, and a basting length is just a longer stitch than usual. And it's called that because it's a stitch that is you, when you sew it, you intend to tear it out later. That's what a basting stitch is by definition. So we use a long stitch length so that it's easy to remove those stitches. So I'm going to baste all along here, and that's just regular sewing on the sewing machine, but with a longer stitch length. Then I'm gonna back stitch again when I get to this point and finish sewing. So I'm gonna do that now on the machine. And now I'm using a half inch seam allowance, and I'm just gonna sew regularly until I get to my first mark. And I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna back stitch, stop again, now I'm switching to a basting length. And what that means is I'm just increasing my stitch length to the longest stitch possible. That's a five on my machine. Now I'm just gonna keep sewing. My muslin is sort of bunching up on me just because it's a different texture than my other fabric, but it won't matter because this will all be hidden on the inside. So I'm just going to switch my stitch length back to the normal stitch length. So I'm just going to sink my needle down, stitch a couple stitches, back stitch, and then just go forward. Okay, so just to make sure you've caught all that, if you want to check out what I did, what we've got here is we sewed a normal stitch length to this mark, back stitched a little bit, so I based it till this point, I back stitched again, and then I finished off with a regular stitch length. Okay, so now I'm going to press the seam open, and the important thing here is to make sure you open it up with your two fabrics open those up. So basically what we're going to have is both of our muslin sides facing and then on the wrong side or the right side, the other side, we're seeing our um, front and back of the pillow. So here we're going to press the seam open, which is something we haven't done yet. We've been pressing all of our seams to the side, but in this case we're pressing them open, which means we're just folding the fabrics open like a book and just gently gliding along between that seam. I usually do one quick pass just to kind of get the fabrics open and then I go back and hit it with a lot of steam. Then we're gonna flip it and also steam it from the front. All right, so here we've got our pieces steamed together. And now we're going to, believe it or not, we're going to put the zipper right on this seam. So I'm going to flip this again. We're working from the wrong side. And I'm going to find my marks that I made originally with uh, where my zipper should begin and end. And I'm going to center my zipper right between those marks. So here's my zipper beginning, uh, my zipper hole, and my zipper end. And it's fine if the zipper end kind of extends beyond the mark because you kind of want that to be hidden anyway. I'm now going to pin the zipper in place. I always begin at one end and just lift the zipper, make sure it's centered over the seam. Just pin it down, going across the zipper. And then I just pin it a lot, like every two inches. And just keep checking it each time making sure that the teeth are right over the seam. 
I just think this is the most fun sewing process in the world. I love putting in zippers. Totally get a kick out of it. Something that seems like it should be so hard and so professional is actually really not that difficult, and I love that. I actually think it takes longer to do a pillow without a zipper because if you were to leave, if you were to not do a zipper, you would have to sew this by hand. You'd have to stick your pillow inside and then sew it closed by hand. And um, I kind of have an aversion to hand sewing, and you know, it takes a while. So this is a really quick process. And I always do one last pin just at the very tip top, just on the right side, because that's where we're going to begin sewing. All right, now the next thing we have to quickly talk about is we have to change our presser foot to a zipper foot. And your sewing machine most likely came with a zipper foot. That's something that comes standard with all um, sewing machines. And what a zipper foot does is it allows you to just sew down the side of a zipper teeth and it really will hug the teeth and it kind of does your work for you. It makes it really easy to just sew really close to the zipper teeth without being too close or too far away. It's just a great little tool that kind of makes life easy. So I'm going to just pop off my regular presser foot, stick on my zipper foot, and almost every machine is just as easy as that. I'm going to move my needle over. A zipper foot usually requires you to move your needle to the side. That's something that you would just check your own sewing machine manual for just to be familiar with how you work those controls on your machine. Okay, so just to kind of help you visualize what's going to happen before I do it, I'm going to start sewing right up here with my zipper foot. I'm going to sew all the way down the side of the zipper. When I get to the end, right before my DIY stopper, I'm going to turn and pivot. I'm going to go all the way back up. I'm going to come back up here and I'm going to go across. I'm going to meet my stitching where I originally started and make a complete square of stitching all the way around my zipper teeth. So let's do it. And again, your zipper foot really is kind of a magical thing that does the work for you here. It really makes something that seems hard very easy because it's the zipper foot's job to just kind of glide right along your zipper teeth. So it's not hard at all. I, you know, you don't have to you don't have to work very hard to position your stitching. To the end, I'm going to stop right before my stopper. I'm going to put my needle down in the fabric because I need to pivot. And whenever you need to pivot or turn in your with your sewing, you always want to keep your needle down because that sort of locks your position into place. We're going to raise the presser foot and turn the work. And since the needle is down in the fabric, everything is going to stay in the position we want it to be in. We're going to sew right across the zipper, just a few stitches. There we are. Needle down, raise the presser foot, pivot again. And now we're just going to zip back up the other side. And this side is really easy because the zipper is already stitched in place, essentially. So we're just, we're on the home stretch, baby. There's nothing can go wrong now. So we're just going all the way back up. tricky sewing around the zipper pole. It's pretty common for your stitching to kind of like bow out a little bit. It's okay. Don't worry. No one's going to inspect the bottom of your pillow. So I'm just going to gently nudge my way around the zipper pole. Here I am back at where I started. I'm going to pivot, go across to where I began. Where I met up with my original stitching, I'm going to pivot one more time and I'm just going to do a little back stitching and that's just going to kind of like complete the rectangle. So I have one nice neat rectangle of stitching. All right, trim these threads. Okay, 
Are you ready to have your mind blown? Because now is when the amazingness happens. So here we have the front of our pillow. It looks like a seam. This is our seam ripper. We're just going to gently pluck out a couple of stitches. And the reason I say gently is that it's easy to get really excited that your zipper's almost done and actually poke with your seam ripper all the way through your zipper tape and cut a big hole in your zipper tape. So just want to be careful and make sure you're only cutting through your basting stitches, not through the zipper. And then we're just going to gently zip, no pun intended, all the way down this basting seam. And then, look at that, here's your zipper. Ta-da! Very, very pleased with my zippers all the time. Now you're always going to get all these little hairy, uh, hairy bits of stitches from where you pulled out your basting. So uh, just take a second and pull those out. And it's worth it to do that right away because you don't want one of those to get stuck in your zipper and jam up your beautiful new zipper. Sometimes I even have to get out my tweezers to pull out all these little bits. All right, look at that. We have a zipper. All right, we are so close to being done with this pillow. You wouldn't believe it. There's just one little step left. Um, first, it's important to open the zipper at this point because if not, you're going to sew your whole pillow inside out with the zipper closed and it actually can be very tricky to, uh, to get that zipper open from inside out. So now we're going to fold the whole thing inside out, zipper open, remember, and just line everything back up. It should kind of fall in place pretty easily. So we've got our open zipper along one end, and now we've got these three sides that we need to sew up. So I'm just going to pin all around those three sides, going through all the layers now, the two layers of muslin, the patchwork, and the pillow back. I love this part because you're so close to the end, and it still kind of looks like a mess, but you are just moments away from having a beautiful finished pillow. And have you noticed how much pillows cost in the stores? As someone who sews, it's like offensive when I see how much they want to charge for a little pillow cover. And you can make your own in a couple of hours. I mean, this once you get the process down for this project, you can literally make this in a couple of hours. And by the way, you could also skip the patchwork part and just do a solid front and fabric, solid front and back fabric um, on the pillow. Maybe you want to do one patchwork and then a couple of coordinating solid ones. The solid ones are so fast to make because you just cut out one square and you're ready to go. Okay, I'm going to sew all the way around all three sides. There's just one little teeny tiny trick I'm going to do. And that is because when we get to the top here, we don't want to sew these edges of the zipper tape down. That would actually create a little like bunchy spot um, along that seam. We want to sew these with the zipper, this whole seam extended upwards. So to make that a little easier, what I like to do is I like to start sewing here, go all the way around, all the way up. When I get to this side, I just extend those pieces of fabric and just sew right up to that seam line and back stitch and stop. And then I'm going to go back and just pick up here and do that last part. It's just hard to get that if you start right there. It's easier to get it if you kind of go from this way. So um, I'm just going to do that in two little pieces. That's the only minor tricky thing. Otherwise, I'm just zipping all the way around with half inch seam allowance. So we need to move our needle position back to center and change our presser foot back to the regular presser foot. So now we're back to our regular settings and we're just going to sew normally.
sewing, you want to remember that your machine needs a little bit of regular maintenance. For example, you should change your needle um, periodically. I mean, it's hard to say. There are some rules that you should change it after every so many hours of sewing, but I don't know that that many of us really keep track of how many hours we've been at the machine. But um, it's just good to remember that your needle really can get dull, and sometimes you might keep your needle in there for years and not think about it. Um, if you're ever sewing and you think that something is just off, your stitches don't look good, or if you're seeing like little tiny snags in your fabric, try changing your needle. Often that can be um, a really impactful thing on the appearance of your stitching. And the other thing I find whenever someone's having trouble with their sewing machine, and we see this constantly in our classes here at Brooklyn Craft Company, if it's just like, my sewing machine isn't working, I don't know what's wrong, it looks like a bird's nest on the back of the piece I'm sewing, just re-thread your machine and reload your bobbin, and I swear 95% of the time that will fix whatever was wrong with your machine. I don't know why, I never will, it's a mystery of the universe, but everyone I know agrees that re-threading your machine fixes most of the problems you'll have. And don't forget that your machine needs to be clean and oiled. It should be clean and oiled every time you sew. And most of us, myself included, skip that step way too often. But check your sewing machine manual. It's really easy to just clean and oil your machine and that will just keep it happy for years and years and years. Okay, so this side is done. I just have to quickly go in and do the other side because remember I left that little opening. And the reason for that is just so that I could go back now. It's much easier to do that top edge if you approach from below than if you approach from above. So I'm just gonna find my original stitching, align my needle with that. Just gonna take a couple stitches, back stitch, and that's enough to just kind of join my two rows of stitching so they're gonna be secure. And again, I'm just going to fold this seam open or closed rather kind of fold the zipper out of the way and keep that flat and just sewing right up to the line of stitching not over it and then back and there we go that should be secure all right last step is to trim the corners and this is something you do whenever you're sewing something that you're then gonna turn right side out and it's gonna have corners. You wanna trim away the excess fabric because that will reduce bulk from the corners and allow you to get a much sharper corner rather than a kind of like rounded chubby looking corner. This will give you a nice, a nice sharp corner. So I usually cut off the edge of the corner altogether and then kind of, this is called grading the seam allowance when you sort of shave down the seam allowance a little bit. I'll do the same up here. All right, moment of truth. All that's left to do is turn the pillow inside out. And you're just gonna reach in, poke out those corners, you can use something sharp, but not too sharp to point the, uh, poke these out. Something like um, the eraser end of a pencil, maybe a chopstick. Just be careful you don't pick something so sharp that it will puncture your fabric because that can happen. And that would be very, very sad after all the work that we've put into this so far. So we're gonna get all four corners. All right. It's pillow form time. I've got my pillow here. This is the best moment. The great thing about these is once you get the hang of it, you can like switch out your pillow covers all the time. You'll have like a rotating cast of awesome pillows and it's such a great way to give a new look to a room with just a tiny investment of time. All right, the big beautiful moment. Let's zip our zipper closed. And that's it.
Does it all look good? It's so professional. I love doing the back with the pattern solid fabric because it's just such a fun way. To just add another element. You see like a little peak of it when you're when you're looking at the patchwork from the front. You see a little peak of that pattern on the back, and it just adds a little something. And you can even flip them around on the couch depending on your mood for the day. I love that you can make so many of these so quickly. I mean, if you get on a roll, you can just make a ton of different pillow covers in different colors and even different fabrics, and you can just switch them out all the time. Such a great way to add a new look to your living room or your bedroom. Just throw a couple of new pillows on there, and it's like freshens up the whole space. Happy pillow making.